what before I start talking about Silicon Valley Bank and anything else, just want to give you a quick update as far as things that are going on. Um, you know, many of you are very kind to ask about me and my family whenever we get together and have a meeting. Um, we're, my family's doing wonderfully. Uh, Michelle and I just uh, took a quick vacation down to uh, Cancun. We were safe, but I had a great time. Went down with another couple, uh, some old friends from Ohio. Uh, it was a nice getaway. And uh, our boys are doing well. Um, my oldest son, Jackson's a senior at NC State, uh, supposed to graduate in May in sports management. He's in spring break in Florida, so keep him in your prayers. Make sure he gets home safely. And then our youngest son, Dylan, is a freshman at Elon in Burlington, and uh, he's home. Uh, he was supposed to get his wisdom teeth taken out Tuesday. So we took him in Tuesday morning, and the dentist says, I can't do it. There's nerves too close to the wisdom teeth. And, uh, you know, I've never seen a young man disappointed not to get his wisdom teeth. He was pre mentally prepared to get those wisdom teeth taken out. And uh, so anyway, he's he's been doing some golfing and just kind of chilling uh, at our house. And, of course, mom loves having him home and cooking meals for him. So we're doing real well. So as everyone knows, uh, we have uh, we have two wonderful associates that really make my life much easier because they really make things run so smoothly here in the office. And so I want to turn it over to Megan for a second. We're right in the middle of tax season. I know you've been getting tax forms probably since the beginning of February. Uh, some of you may have already done your tax returns. Uh, good for you if you've done. Um, so I just want Megan to talk briefly because uh, sometimes you know, you're not quite sure, do I have all my tax forms? Megan, can you give us a quick update? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Good morning. So as of this past Wednesday, the 15th, all 1099s have been sent out. So if you have not received one, hang tight. It's coming. Or you may be able to access it online. Um, you may have received a preliminary one earlier so if you haven't received your final one, that is coming as well. So just hang tight. They are in process. Very good. And then, Robert, if you could just touch on what if someone needs their tax information? Yeah, absolutely. And nice to meet everybody this morning. So if you have not gotten a tax form and you don't think it's on the way, please just feel free to give me a phone call. I know sometimes life happens. Maybe even you misplaced a form. You can just give me a phone call and I will go ahead and securely email those tax forms right to your CPA to make your life easier. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Robert. So um, one of the neat things about Zoom webinars, you can do polls. So the first poll here is... Uh, I want you to answer this. How do you like your coffee? You like it black? You add the good stuff or you don't touch it? Uh, all right. All right, good stuff in the lead. Oh, you got one person doesn't touch it. All right, very good. So appreciate that. Uh, I'll just share the results here. 33% drinking black, 56% like to add a little sweeten sweetener to it. And one person doesn't drink it. Good for you. Of course, they say coffee's good for you. So uh, you might be missing out. So let's talk about what's happened over this past week. Uh, so first of all, with Silicon Valley Bank and, uh, you know, I, I'm probably like you. We probably never heard of the bank before last weekend. So what's happened? And we really have to go back almost three years. So when COVID started, you know, the government bent over backwards to make sure we did not have a severe recession, you know. And I know it seems like forever ago when we were completely shut down, but at the same time, it seems like yesterday. And I know none of us missed that. However, when the government started pumping trillions and trillions of dollars into the economy, it was like a sugar high. 
okay? And it really, really threw our economy out of balance. If you remember, people were staying at home, they were shopping online, uh, you know, even Zoom went through the roof as a company because people were doing everything virtually. And so it, it really kind of, you know, it messed up the supply chains. Um, you know, eventually we couldn't get certain products, couldn't get computer chips for cars. So right now we're still working through that. We're try trying to get to an equilibrium within the economy. Well, what transpired is with all that money flowing, really, it causes inflation. When you have too many dollars chasing too few goods, that causes inflation. And so, you know, last summer, inflation pay peaked yeah, almost 9%. Now, every month when they report it, it's slowly been ticking down. And inflation's, I think they came out this week, year over year, it's up about 6%. So it is declining, but, you know, we've been used to 1% to 2% inflation. So, you know, 2% versus 6%, that's still a pretty large gap. And I know you've seen it. Boy, you go to the grocery store, you talk about eggs and milk, um, you know, it, you just, you go to the restaurants. I mean, you can't have lunch, uh, you know, a simple lunch. You can't have a lunch for less than 12 bucks. Um, so, you know, we got to get this inflation out of the system. Well, that's why the Federal Reserve has been increasing interest rates, you know, for really the past almost 12 months now. And um, so, you know, what happens at these banks is, you know, before the, the inflation and the Fed raised rates, interest rates were basically zero, okay? So if a bank takes in deposits, they got two things they can do with that money. Number one is they can loan it out to their customers in the forms of loans, mortgages, business loans, student loans, things like that. The second thing a bank can do is they can invest that money. Now, they can't be crazy with it. There's some regulations they have to follow. But most times, banks will take those what they call excess reserves, and they'll buy bonds. And um, usually, they're treasury bonds, which is considered really the safest investment in the world uh, because of the taxing authority of the United States government. Well, the average bank has about 15 to 20% of their reserves in bonds, government bonds, 15 to 20%. Um, Silicon Valley Bank had 60%, 60% of their money in government bonds. But here's the problem. They took that money, you know, over the last three years, um, and they bought 30-year government bonds paying less than 1%. Let me repeat that. They bought 30-year government bonds paying less than 1%. Well, as many of you know, when interest rates go up, bonds go down in value. It's an inverse relationship, okay? So if you can imagine a 30-year bond, you know, right now has lost probably 20, 25% of its value because who's going to buy a 30-year bond at half of a percent when you can get, you know, five, four and a half percent on a six-month treasury bill right now? So, they had um, they had a bond portfolio that was severely down in value because of rising rates. And so they weren't able to create, they weren't able to create the liquidity they needed for their customers, okay? So they had to sell some of these bonds at steep, steep losses. And you, I think it was about 1.8 billion of losses, okay? So it was really poor, poor management on behalf of this bank. And, um, you know, there was a couple other things that they did. Um, many of their clients, and you can imagine Silicon Valley, they had, I think, about 30,000 businesses that banked with them. And these were relatively good-sized businesses. Um, and those businesses um, have large deposits. Because if you run a business, you know, you you don't keep 50,000 in the bank. You keep Three million, five million in the bank because you got to meet payroll. Okay, well we all know you're only insured up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So they have big depositors, 
And I think there was, what I've heard is about 90% of their deposits were not insured, meaning they were over the 250. So only 10% of their deposits were insured, which is way, way uh, uh, skewed compared to most banks. The other thing is they're lending money to startup companies out in Silicon Valley. Well, these Silicon, when, when interest rates go up, the economy goes down, these startup companies require huge amounts of cash. And so they had to borrow more money. And so it just, that's why they were having to create some liquidity for these uh, startup companies. So it was just kind of a confluence of events, uh, but it was very poor management on behalf of the bank. Now, we heard yesterday and last night that there's a bank called, I think, I think it's First Republic, that was injected with uh, tens of billions of dollars from other banks. So think about it. Um, first of all, over the last 30 years, the number of banks in the United States has gone from about 8,000 down to 2,500. There's simply not as many banks as there used to be. Um, so what we're seeing here is the banking community, uh, think of the JP Morgans, the Morgan Stanleys, the Bank of America, they don't want to see these other banks fail. Because then if, if one fails, two fails, three fails, then it becomes a cascading effect because Banking is based on a lot on trust. We trust that when we go to the bank, they're going to have our money, okay? If they don't, then they've broken that trust, and then that's when you have a run on the bank. So these banks injected, I think it was either 20 or $30 billion into First Republic last night uh, just to prop that bank up to make sure it didn't have to go into receivership under the FDIC. So... You know, the question is, is this a one-off, you know, these one, two or three banks that we're seeing, or is it, you know, canary in the coal mine? Is it going to be a cascading effect? Are we going to see many more banks fail? Well, one thing I want to point out is that whenever you have economic distress, market distress, like we've had over the past 12 months, things like this happen. Um, back in the 89, 90, we had the savings and loan crisis. Uh, I was just starting my career back then. And I know it was just blew up. It was the biggest deal ever savings and loans. You, know, you don't hear about them anymore. Um, there was a thing called long-term capital management, which was a hedge fund in the nineties that went bankrupt. Um, and that was a, a, you know, a big, big deal back then we had the dot-com bubble, um, we had the mortgage crisis of 08. So the thing is, when you have rapidly rising rates or you have an economic downturn or you have the market going down, these things kind of lay bare the, weak, the weakness within some of these corporations, okay? And, you know, it is it's tough to see, especially if you're a depositor of one of these banks, but frankly, you know, it's survival of the fittest. And uh, if these are not well-run companies, then, you know, maybe they need to fail. Uh, but, you know, we want to see people made whole. Now, that's the other thing we've seen here is that the government did step up in and basically insured all deposits. So even if someone had $10 million at Silicon Valley Bank, the government still insured it all. They said, you're not going to lose a dime. Well, that is totally totally uh, new policy from the government because before that it was $250,000. So it's going to be interesting to see where does this lead? Does that mean all your deposits at the bank are insured? Um, so we'll just have to wait and see. So I, I know I'm uh, talking a lot here. Uh, I'm just going to pause. And again, if you, anyone has any questions, uh, you should see a Q&A button and a chat button, or you can just simply unmute yourself and interrupt me. And I'm just going to pause while I take a drink of coffee. I should have said at the beginning, this is supposed to be interactive. <laughs> so maybe- hey, just... I question for you. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. So Bank of, America, if Bank of America invested $2 billion, is what I'm hearing, <clears throat> to, to prevent this bank from 
uh, going into receivership, I guess, with the FDIC. Um, does that mean I own part, own part of the bank now if I have money at Bank of America? <laughs> or is it not, not that simple? <laughs> so my understanding is they took some of their capital and they put it on deposit with First Republic. So they're basically a depositor of First Republic. So they're not an owner in the bank. Now, if the bank failed, they might have some, um, well, even then, I'm, I'm not even quite sure how it would work. So I think the answer is no, Steve. I think that's on, if, if First Republic were to fail and if Bank of America lost that $2 billion, then that's something the bank would have to, to eat and absorb which for a bank the size of Bank of America is like, you know, $200 to us. Gotcha. You know, I understand. It was kind of a um, sarcastic question, but at the same time, I'm trying to understand a, a, of how all this works. Um, it, to me, it's pretty confusing. <laughs> it's well, not as simple as, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point, Steve. Think about it. The, the Treasury Department, which oversees all these banks, okay, they didn't see it. Are you kidding me? You're you're following 2,500 banks and you didn't see this happening. Now, remember, after 2008, they passed very stringent. It's called Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank is very stringent financial controls on banks. And it was supposed to prevent stuff like this. And that's the thing. You know, you can regulate all you want but if you got bad managers bad players and i'm not saying they did this intentionally but it, you know you can't regulate uh stupidity or smartness you know it is what it is and and that's kind of where we're where we're seeing ourselves right now yeah so i i would say this i was on a call earlier this week with the raymond james banking analysts and they feel that this is not this is not uh, a prelude to a bunch of bank failures. They do not think this is systemic. Okay, I think the good thing is is that by this happening, I think I think Treasury has woken up and said, okay, let's look at all these banks. Who is weak? Who do we need to keep an eye on? So I think there is much greater tension right now. And just like with First Republic, they identified another weak bank and the other banks came together to prop it up. So I, I think there's uh, an awareness now that maybe there wasn't there two weeks ago. And there's also a, more of a strategy. Okay, once we find these weak banks, what are we going to do about it? Okay. Dave, could I just mention... Um... The, you said to use chat. Actually, it says chat disabled when I try to use it. Okay, uh, let's see. I'm glad you brought that to my attention, Tom. Maybe uh, it's only me. <laughs> yeah, it's just this is Edie. It's disabled on on mine as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can uh, I, I can pull it up on mine. I haven't used it. I use the Q and A function instead. But all right, I do see that. So Jack, your question is: How do the our Raymond James analysts view this banking issue? I think I just mentioned yeah. that yeah, long term issue. Yep, yep. So you were typing that as I was answering, didn't I? Yep. So yeah, we don't we don't think this is systemic. Um, now, the Fed is probably going to keep in raising interest rates, and that's the question: how much, how fast, how long? We don't know. Nobody, they don't know. All right. Um, so the, here's the thing: we got to get this inflation under control. Inflation. I'm just telling you, folks. Inflation is the silent killer. I know for those of you on Social Security, your benefits went up, what, 8% this year? But you know what? It was just taken back. I mean, food, health care, I don't care what it is. It, 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 you're just keeping pace. You know, it, it is the silent tax. And uh, inflation is the worst thing you can have in any economy. 
Um, Dave, could I ask a question about the uh, bank failing out in California? So sure. um, I understand bad investments and somebody did that, some of the investors. What about the board of directors? Wouldn't they yeah. have been able to catch something like that? Yeah, that's a good point. So what I've read, and maybe you've seen some of these articles too, is that uh, the board of directors was basically uh, kind of like the friends or uh, political donors uh, that matched up with the CEO. Uh, so it was not an effective board. It was not a very experienced board. Uh, most of them were large political donors. Um, many of them were friends of the CEO. And again, <laughs> I, I hate to say it, when, when something is poorly run, it's eventually going to be found out. And so you are exactly right, Tom. The board of directors oversees the, the long-term strategy and policy of the bank. They oversee the CEO uh, and their actions. And they were basically AWOL during the whole thing. So uh, hopefully other boards are much more engaged in, in, in their oversight. Absolutely. Um, I want to do another poll here. So stop sharing. So here's the next poll. I believe in 2023, the stock market will end higher and lower be pretty much flat. Looks like we got seven answers. So let me share the results. Well, you're a positive bunch all, 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 in, <laughs> all in here. Nobody, nobody says end lower. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I'm a little surprised by that, but pleased, but very pleased. That may uh, be uh, just a little hope too, Dave. <laughs> just a little hope. You, yeah. you didn't have much because only one of you said it would go higher. <laughs> It, it may be the coffee talking. <laughs> Was that you, Jack? Yeah. <laughs> you didn't say how much, did, did you? So I think you're all, I, I, so I'll tell you, and I don't mean to put thoughts in your mind, but the way I read this is I'll believe it when I see it. You know, I want it to go higher, but until I see it, I'm not going to believe it. So uh, I think that's probably why most of you, uh, put it as, uh, as flat. So let's talk about the market. First of all, I, uh, I don't know. And sometimes, sometimes I answer questions that probably don't need to be answered. Okay. I don't know if any of you are asking about, well, Dave, Raymond James is your custodian, our custodian for you too. Are they strong? Are they healthy? Well, let me answer that. I got a couple slides here I want to share. Does everyone see this slide? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. All right. Um, so right now, Raymond James has 8,700 advisors. Total client assets are $1.17 trillion. Okay. Now I can remember 10 years ago, any company had a trillion dollars is a big deal. Um, it's still a big deal. A trillion is still a lot of money. Uh, but there's many firms like Raymond James that manage over a trillion dollars. Now, there's rating agencies, Fitch, S&P, and Moody's. And you can see A-, minus, A-, minus, A3, which is pretty solid ratings. Now, I will say this, okay? The rating agencies have been wrong in the past. Okay, and I'm not saying they're wrong now. I'm just saying never put your full faith and confidence in a rating agency. Okay. Um, now, 
Raymond James is a publicly traded company. And for 140 consecutive quarters, they've been profitable. Okay. And that's, that's pretty solid. I think that means something. Then they talk about strength. And, and this is kind of like with banks. There's a thing called capital ratio and tier one leverage ratio. And I'll be honest, I looked up both definitions of those, and it's a little bit over my head, folks. I'm not a banking regulator. I'm not an accountant. All I can tell you is that the regulators, okay, require 10% capital ratio. Raymond James is at 20.4 or two times above the required. Tier, level, tier one leverage ratio, the regulators require 5%. We're at 10.3%, which is two times the requirement, which is good. <laughs> okay, it's not bad. It's good. So just want to let you know that, that Raymond James has been well capitalized um, even back in 08 when like Merrill Lynch failed basically and had to get bought out by Bank of America. Raymond James didn't have to go through any of that. So I, I just want you to know that your custodian, Raymond James, is, is very solid and they do a they do a good job. So um I gotta get my controls back. <laughs> now, just to share a couple of slides as far as the market's concerned. Uh, and I, I don't want to turn this into any type of formal presentation, but uh, I can't do it this way. Um, I Just a couple of key slides, stock performance after recessions. Now, here's the thing, folks. We don't know if we're in a recession. You know, we may be in one right now, maybe three months from now. Maybe we're already in one uh, or we're in one. The thing about recessions is they are not officially declared until they're over, okay? So what will happen maybe a year from now is that there's a bureau will come out and say, oh, yeah, back in July of 23, we were in a recession, all right? So we don't know, okay? But here's the point. Uh, there's no question the economy has slowed down, but a recession is when we the economy starts to shrink. Okay, it gets smaller. All right. And we can see here, let's look after one year, and the, the light blue is large stocks. After one year, historically, stocks are up 17%. And after three years, stocks are up about 44% after the recession. Okay. But again, we don't know if we're in one right now. Here, if we go back to 08, 09, all right. So we remember what most of us remember back in 08, the market went down 57%, all right? Well, in January of 09, was just about the worst, okay? And you had three choices. Do I sell? Do I hold? You know, do I get out? Um, or do I, well, did I say that right? <laughs> Let's say I hold on to it. I get out and put money in cash. Uh, or... I just get out of the market completely. So the blue line shows if you had stayed in the market, you would have gone back up to 456,000. Now, let's say you got out of the market for a year, you waited for it to recover some, okay? Because you wanted to proof that it was going to recover. And then you got back in, then it would grow to 297. But let's say you took, took the green, you took the money out of the market and put it in cash you'd have $57,000, okay? So I always say this, it's our behavior that determines our investment success. So it's during difficult times. I know we're about 15 months into this market being down from our all-time high, okay? And I know you get your statements every month, you know, like it just reminds you. Um, so it doesn't last forever, it will turn around and we do need to continue hanging on there because we know we will be rewarded on the other side. Okay. Um, 
So we just need to have that that confidence and and stay stay invested. And I will say this: you, our clients, have been wonderful. You've been patient. You've been disciplined. I'm very proud of everyone. Um, I know it hasn't been easy for you, but uh, I, I just I, I can't say enough good words about you as our clients and what you've done. Um, just looking again, U.S. market recovery after financial crisis. These are some of the things I mentioned. Savings and loan, long-term capital, dot-com, uh, 9-11, bank, uh, mortgage crisis. But again, you can see how the market recovers, whether it be one year, the light green, three years, the dark green, or five years, uh, the dark blue. There was really only one exception. That was back in the dot-com time. Uh, if you remember back in 2002, we had another downturn. So that was kind of a unusual time. But just about every other time, we had a pretty darn good recovery after that. So let me just pause right here. Uh, be, be happy to answer any questions anybody might have. This is Edie. I have one. Yeah, Edie. So the um, those recovery times that you just highlighted in that graph um, for this time that we're going through now when would the starting point of the one year three year and five years be considered as the starting point yeah good question good question so really from the bottom wherever that bottom is uh ed so you know that's the thing we don't know have we already hit the bottom you know, was it, you know, I think back in October was kind of like the the bottom right now, okay? And it seems like we're getting close to it. But I think October was probably the bottom. Now, we might create a new bottom, you know, in April, all right? We don't know. Um, but when we look back, and we, we can then, let's say 12 months from now, we can say, oh, yeah, October of 22 was the bottom. And that's where they measure from as far as the recovery. So it'd be based on the bottom of the market. Okay, thanks. Yep. So um, I do have another poll. This would be the last one. Um, let's see. Is, do you all see it yet? No. No, you don't, do you? No. Okay. Well, for some reason, it won't let me launch that poll. Okay. So let me just read this out loud, and you can verbalize your... Uh... So I am most concerned about are you concerned about inflation? Are you concerned about market volatility? Are you concerned about recession? Or are you concerned that we're going to have a repeat of 2008? I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can only choose one, Steve. <laughs> Too late. Yeah, I want to choose two. Which two, Edie? The market volatility and concern about the, what was the last one, recession? 2008. Or a repeat of 2008, yeah. 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 Same here, Dave, number two. Number two, market? Yeah, I'd say the same for me, Dave, number two. I think it's pretty hard to predict what's going to happen over the next few years. Yep. Yeah. I would too. I would choose to, but um, I don't understand how recession. I don't understand everything about recession, how it affects me. I know there's something about prices, maybe, uh, but maybe you can enlighten me. <laughs> so just to make sure I fully clear on your question, Tom, you know, if we do go into recession, are you asking how that could affect you? Yes. Okay. Well, okay, and just let everyone know, Tom's retired, uh, several of you are, or you're close to retirement. Um, you know, sometimes in recession, I think the big thing is, if you're working, 
you can lose your job. Oh. That's a that's a big thing, right? Um, so, so if you're retired, I think it's a little bit different. Um, you know, I don't think it's the recession itself, Tom. I think it's kind of what, how would that affect everything else? And I think I've probably shared this with most of you. I think there's been seven or eight recessions since 1970, 50 years, okay? Every recession, the market hit, mm -hmm. his, hit a bottom first, then the recession hit a bottom. By the time the recession hit a bottom, the market had already started its recovery. You might say, well, why? Why would the market start going up while the economy is still getting worse? Remember, the market is a forward indicator. The market is looking toward the future. I've always heard the term six to nine months into the future. So if we go into recession, recessions typically last about six, eight months, not long, okay? Well, if we know that and we're starting going into the recession, then the market says, you know what? We're going to be coming out of that recession, you know, in six to eight months and things are going to get better. Therefore, prices start to get bid up and the market starts to go up. And that's what we've seen typically every time in the last 50 years. Um, so now are we saying, hey, I hope we have a recession so then we can start going up. Well, maybe you maybe we say that. Um, but, you know, how does it affect uh, directly affect you, Tom? You know, I think, you know, in a way it might help. You know, and here's here's what I'm thinking. If you go into a recession, meaning the economy is actually shrinking, there's less demand for goods and services. Could that help bring inflation down? Yeah, yeah. And that's what the Fed is trying to do. So it actually could reduce the cost of living, you know, and if you're retired and you're on a fixed income, that's important. You know, you want your food and your gas and everything, heating, utility bills, to be lower or at least stable, not increasing. Um, so I don't know if it directly affects you, um, but I think it's the ancillary things like the market that that would be more impactful to you. And uh, so, you know, I, I nobody knows if we're going to the recession. We just don't know. Now, here's the thing. Let's talk. We always bring it back to planning. And so, you know, every time we get together, we're, we're doing that projection for you all, okay? And we want to input as accurate of information as we can. We, we focus on your spending plan, your other goals, travel, gifting to kids, uh, gifting to charity, what, uh, home improvements, whatever it may be. As, as long as we're detailed and accurate in our projection, and by rerunning it, even when things are down, that gives us the confidence and the reassurance that we're still on the right track. Okay. I've, I've said this to some of you. Now is a great time to do a projection because if it works during difficult times, it'll look even better during better times. So good question. Any other questions? Dave, a question for me, and I have a hard time understanding, uh, maybe you can elaborate, is you see the impact that the job numbers are having on the market and decisions that are being made. It's kind of counterintuitive to me a little bit that when you see such strong growth in the job market that it's having, I'll say, somewhat of a negative impact. Yeah, so... And just make sure I'm, we're on the same page here, Frank. So, you know, we're still adding three to five hundred thousand dollar, three, three, three hundred to five hundred thousand jobs per month. The unemployment rate is still about three point six percent. Um, and you know that's not a sign of a recession, is it? No. Yeah, and um, you know, Frank works for a large company here in Greenville. And they're they're hiring many many people, and they're like most corporations, they're having trouble finding qualified individuals 
uh, to do the work. And so, you know, it's kind of that, it's contradictory that if the economy is slowing down, why is it still so difficult to, to find good quality workers? Frank, I think it goes back to COVID. Um, COVID threw those in, we, we, COVID created all these imbalances. And I think one of the biggest imbalances has been in employment and uh, employees. And so I don't know the answer. I, you know, some of this stuff, I, so I started, I really started following the markets around 1980. And if you remember, that's when interest rates were 16, 18%. We had super high inflation. Okay. Uh, the markets hadn't been doing well in the seventies. I got into the business in 88. All right. Um, so I would say right now, the closest analogous period we have is the early 80s. And we have not seen a period like this in, is that 50 years, okay, or 40 years. Um, so I'll tell you what, I think even the experts don't quite understand or grasp everything that's going on right now. So Frank, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I, I don't know if anyone knows. No, thanks, Dave. Um, it just what, seems it seems counter to, you know, I mean, the Fed listening to them talk about it, that they, they, they I mean, maybe the job rate uh, is somewhat out of control and they want to bring it, but they're, it's like they're purposely trying to figure out ways to reduce the job growth number, which... Well, I don't, I, I don't think, I don't, I don't, I don't know. yeah, I don't know if that's their direct intent is to slow the job growth. Um, I do know that wages, and you could probably attest to this, Frank, you, you got to pay more for these workers, don't you? Oh, yeah, we're, we're yeah, that's uh, struggled. Most of the businesses, I think, are, you know, even from the restaurants here, you know, minimum wage all the way up to what we're, we're having to, uh, offer just because of such a competitive job market. Yeah, yeah. And that's inflation. Wage growth is inflation um, because companies have to pass those costs along to their consumers, whether it be other businesses or us, the retail public. Um, so I think when the Fed is raising these interest rates, they're trying to get the whole economy to just kind of cool off, to slow down. And now, remember this. When the Fed raises interest rates, it takes a while for these higher rates to have an effect. There's a lag, okay? So it's not like you raise rates today and all of a sudden, boop, things stop. No. So, you know, even now, the, I mean, the mortgage rates run around six, seven, um, but the Fed funds rate, which is what the Fed adjusts is around four and a half, five. So, you know, historically, that's not been a high rate, has it? You know, I remember when I started, you know, rates were 10 or 12%. So even now, even though rates are higher, historically, they, they're, they're still low. Um, but I think the, the Fed is just trying to slow the entire economy to just try and wring that inflationary excess out of the system. And it's very hard to do. It's very difficult and it's going to take time. So, any other questions? Well, those were the main things I wanted to cover. Um, you know, I appreciate everybody uh, jumping on and uh, doing the first webinar with us. Uh, when we exit here, you're going to have a poll uh, just to say, is there something we should do again? And uh, just be honest, you know, if you enjoyed it, say yes. If if not, just say no. Um, we we would love to stay in touch. Um, we just think this is kind of a kind of a community, you know, that we can get together and share concerns and questions. Because you know, if you're thinking it, I, I guarantee you, someone else is thinking the same thing. So. I hope everyone has a great weekend and uh, whatever you're doing, uh, do it safely. And uh, 
we'll talk to you all in the very near future. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, thank Dave. You. Ciao, everybody. Take care now. Bye. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. Bye-bye.